Hey everybody. In the last three lessons, we discussed different ways of thinking about ellipses. And today we're going to begin discussing the third type of conic section, in addition to parabolas and ellipses, the hyperbola. So we're mainly going to be looking at this equation, which graphs as the picture you see on the right. A hyperbola has two uh, branches, they're called. And this particular hyperbola, like an ellipse, has a center at hk. And you probably note that this formula looks a lot like the ellipse formula, except that there's a minus instead of a plus. And we're going to get our first bit of information about how this thing behaves by the fact that on this line, this green line, I'm going to make an argument for those two points are also on the ellipse uh, with the same formula, except that there's a plus instead of a minus. So imagine uh, that so this line is the line y is equal to k. And imagine that you plugged in k uh, for the y value. In other words, you're trying to find the x values on this line. And then these simplify to 0. And now it's the same equation. And if you were to solve for x, you'd get the same point. And so what this means is that these points will be on the ellipse as well. Uh, and so on an ellipse, the distance from the center uh, to the end of the horizontal axis is going to be a. And in this horizontal hyperbola, that distance is also going to be a. And those points are shared, as you see in the video, by both the ellipse and the hyperbola. Just as a reminder, before we get any further in our analysis, in our presentation, a will always refer to a horizontal dimension, and b will always refer to a vertical dimension. And A will always appear under X and B will always appear under Y. In some treatments, A will always be first in a hyperbola. And, um, and in some treatments, A will always be the bigger one. And what I'm saying is that for my treatment, A is always going to be under X and B is always going to be under Y. So in the previous slide, we saw that A is the distance from the center to what's called the vertex of a hyperbola because it's the same thing as it would be for an ellipse, the endpoint of the horizontal axis. That distance is a for the ellipse, so it also must be a for this horizontal hyperbola. But we don't know what b does yet. So the first task will get us closer to figuring out what b does, not immediately, but uh, after a few more steps. So task one is take the hyperbola formula and solve for y. It's an algebraic exercise, but also it'll help us discover what b is. Try it out. In order to solve for y in this equation, we need to first get y, the y term by itself. So one thing we can do is add the, the y term, this green term, to both sides and subtract the 1 from both sides to um, get the y squared by itself. And then just reverse the order to have it on the left-hand side, just to make it nice and, and simple. And then we multiply both sides by b squared in order uh, to further get the y term alone. And now we can take the square root of both sides. Remember when we take the square root of both sides, we always have a plus or minus because there are two answers uh, to, to when you have a, take a square root of some number. And then you add k to both sides. And then we get the answer. So y is equal to a large square root expression plus k. And we're going to analyze this expression, particularly the square root part. And this will be our key to unlocking the behavior of a hyperbola. So what we're going to argue is that when x is extreme, meaning very large or very negative, a hyperbola is going to approach two lines. So take a look at that square root expression in the middle of this equation. And I'm going to highlight two parts of it, the two terms within it. Now, if x were really large, the green part would also become very, very large because you're multiplying by x minus h squared. And when x is large, that thing is large. But the gray part, the negative b squared, wouldn't change and would become increasingly insignificant. So even though that part's going to be the same every time, the square root, when you'd have square roots of numbers, the, the 
a difference of one in the square root is going to be less and less significant. So for example, square root of one is, is further away from the square root of two than the square root of 10,000 is away from the 10,001. And what that means is that when x is large, we can basically ignore the b squared, basically ignore the gray term. Now, this is a little bit not rigorous, what we're saying now. And in calculus, you'll learn techniques for thinking about this more carefully. But basically, when x is large, the b squared isn't there. So I'm going to highlight it even more. Let's just pretend it's not there. And it's going to be more not there the bigger and bigger x gets. And this goes also when x is a very large negative number in, in a sense, like negative a billion or something like that, or even you know closer to zero than that. Now, now this square root expression can be simplified because it's just the square root of a bunch of squares. And so the hyperbola is going to be close to the square root of that expression, which is plus or minus b over a times x minus h plus k. So in other words, we got the equation of a line. These are the lines that the hyperbola approaches as x gets extreme. And these lines are called asymptotes. So this is the main way in which a hyperbola is not the same as a parabola and vice versa. A hyperbola gets closer and closer to certain lines called asymptotes as the curve gets further and further away from the center. But a parabola's steepness keeps on increasing and does not approach an asymptote. You might want to think about how we can argue this more rigorously. Um, but one way to show this intuitively is that if you zoom out on a hyperbola, then you really see that it becomes two pairs of lines dictated by the formula that we suggested. And if we zoom out on a parabola, it seems to get uh, steeper and steeper until it looks like a vertical line, but we know it can't be a vertical line because in the middle there isn't a vertical line. And the domain of the parabola is all real numbers, so even though it looks like it, it's a line, it's not a line at any point, it doesn't approach that line. In fact, it, it continually gets further and further away from the center. So basically we have an asymptote formula. Y equals that formula we derived in the previous uh, spot. And if A is the distance from the center to the vertex, then B is the thing that when you hold A constant determines the slope of the asymptote. So here's a visual demonstration. If we change B but leave A constant, you see that A is always going to be the distance from the center to the vertex of the hyperbola, but that the slopes of the lines change. So what B is all about is the slope of the asymptotes. And that allows us to figure out how to graph these things. So how do we sketch certain facets of a horizontal hyperbola? So I am going to teach you basically a, a simple way to graph essential features of the hyperbola. This won't be the most exact graph in the world, but this will give you a sense of how it works. Step one, graph the center. So the center is given by h and k, in this case 2 and negative 4. Step 2, a in a horizontal hyperbola is the distance to the left and the right of the center in order to get to the vertices. So to the right and to the left. And a is 3 in this case. And from each of the vertices, now we're going to go up by b and down by b. Now, once you have that, you have what I call a box. And the box tells you how to draw the hyperbolas correctly because the slope, b over a, is implied by the box. So you just draw diagonal lines through the corners of the box. And then you draw the branches of the hyperbola. Again, not too precisely, but it starts at the vertices and it approaches the lines. And there you get a decent sketch of a hyperbola. Now, this is again not exact because we don't know the focal, the, the width, particularly the width that the focus will be able to find out later. We don't even know what a focus is at this point. So the width of these branches is not 100% accurate, but you get the general idea, and that's what we're going to be at for now. So, task two is sketch the following hyperbola. Try it out.
The results of this hyperbola are shown on the slide. A is 2, B is 1, the center is negative 2, 0. Recall that if there's just a y there, you can think of it as y minus 0. And so that's why the y value of the center is 0. And you draw 2 to the right and left of the center, 1 up and down from the vertices to draw the box that has the slopes of b over a, or 1 over 2, or negative 1 over 2 in this case. And then once you have the asymptotes drawn, you can draw the branches. And once again, this is not very precise because of the width. We don't know how wide the branch is, but this certainly gives us the basic idea of what the hyperbola looks like. So today we learned about the formula of a horizontal hyperbola and how it shares two points with the corresponding ellipse with a plus sign instead of a minus sign there. And those two shared points are the vertices of the hyperbola. We learned that the hyperbola branches approach asymptotes far from the center while parabolas do not. So the uh, hyperbola is not just two parabolas, they behave very differently because of those asymptotes. And using the concept of asymptotes, we learned how to, how to sketch graphs of hyperbolas that capture the ideas we've learned so far, but are not very precise. So like with ellipse, we need to learn more perspectives to deepen our understanding of hyperbolas, and we'll do so in the following lessons. And we're also going to learn about vertical hyperbolas. But until then, have a great day.